You're listening to 15 Minutes, where we feature community leaders sharing what the rest of us should know but likely don't. Hello, listeners. I'm Bala Musitz, host for this episode of the 15 Minutes Share Your Voice podcast, where we talk with top-notch law firms and attorneys about what it takes to grow a successful law practice. This episode is brought to you by Gladiator Law Marketing. They deliver tailor-made services to help your law firm accomplish its objectives and maximize your growth potential. To have a successful marketing campaign and to make sure you're getting the best return on your investment, your firm needs to have a better website and better content. Gladiator Law Marketing uses artificial intelligence, machine learning, and decades of experience to outperform the competition. To learn more, go to gladiatorlawmarketing.com where you can schedule a free marketing consultation. Today's podcast guest is attorney Amanda Baguette. She is the CEO of the Baguette Law Firm located in Jacksonville, Florida. Amanda has 20 years of experience as a lawyer and an arbitrator. She is also a board certified legal expert in roadway design and work zone cases. Amanda has won numerous awards throughout her career, but her favorite in progress accomplishment, call her mom. Welcome to the podcast, Amanda. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit more about the law firm? Yeah, absolutely. So we are a personal injury law firm here in Jacksonville. We actually have three locations in Duval and St. John's County, uh, but our practice is exclusively focused on personal injury and wrongful death cases. So we handle medical malpractice cases. We handle nursing home cases, car accidents. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So that sounds like a highly specialized, uh, sort of practice of law. And, and, uh, so can you talk about some of the special skills that it takes for an attorney to have, to be in that segment of the practice? Well, sure. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's crucial in what we do that our lawyers understand Florida insurance law, um, mm. you know, because with, with what we do when we are pursuing a responsible party, we're really pursuing the available insurance that that party has. Um, you know, in Florida, uh, there are many protections against uh, getting to people's wages and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So when you sue a defendant in the state of Florida, you really are concerned most with the the insurance that's going to apply and cover the the damages in the case. I see. So these are these types of cases uh, are different state to state. Are they also different within a state? Do various sure. different counties have different sorts of laws and regulations about these things? No, not not necessarily as far as uh, the insurance law goes. I mean, different counties have different court rules and, and things like that that every lawyer should be aware of, of course. But yes, Florida is different with regard to um, the required auto insurance. Every state is a little bit different on that. So it's just important that in this area of practice that we understand how those laws work and how they will apply uh, to claims involving auto accidents. Yeah. You know, one of the things that always strikes me is uh, many parts of the country, uh, including Florida, have lots of people, lots of residents from various different backgrounds and various different cultures. So how do you sort of uh, work with people to, to, to explain that cultural norms that maybe they have experienced, you know, in their lives are not exactly what the laws of the country allow you or enable you to do when it comes to these types of suits? Sure. And I think that's a really good question. You know, one thing that we pride ourselves on at Baggett Law is really from the very first phone call is educating our clients and setting the expectations, um, you know, about what they should expect in their case um, and how long a case should take and those sort of things. And so, you know, we really we believe strongly in client um, education as a starting point to make sure that everybody really mm. does understand the process, because you're right. There are so many misconceptions, um, even among other lawyers in different practice areas, as far as, you know, what it takes to have a claim um, and then, you know, how long it's going to take and what will be involved. Yeah. And and when uh, someone calls you and says, hey, I've been in an accident, uh, What's sort of the process that you go through with them to decide whether, you know, there's any merit to bring a case or not? Sure. Well, you know, there, there's so many things to consider. And Florida recently kind of changed the law in some regard with uh, involving claims that are founded in negligence. So car accidents. So so currently with the new change in the law, 
um, in order to recover, a plaintiff must be at least, um, you know, can't be more than 51% at fault for, for his or her injuries, which uh, that's kind of a, a little bit of a complicated legal issue. But, you know, the things that we're looking for are evidence of who really was at fault. So we're looking mm -hmm. for things like you know, photos, any witness statements. The police report is very Im Im important. So we want to make sure that there was a crash report, um, you know, and so we'll take a look at that, um, you know, listen to the evidence to try to figure out, you know, who who was at fault. Sometimes there can be confusion as to who was at fault. And even the um, police officers investigating a crash don't always know. Uh, and so we can also do an independent investigation um, and hire reconstructionists and those sorts of things. So those are the first steps that we take. Wow. Uh, so. Of these uh, cases, from let's say the time I call you uh, to the time that there, is, let's not go down the trial path. Let's just take about a, a, a negotiated settlement. Typically, how long does that cycle take? You know that uh, that really varies depending on the severity of the injuries and what sort of medical treatment is required. Um, and this is something that a lot of people don't don't understand. But in order for us to un to know to be able to calculate what we believe your economic damages are and your non-economic damages, so what the total ask should be that we're requesting, we need to know you know what your injuries are and what kind of future medical care you will need. Mm. And so at some point, you know, let's say that someone has an injury that re requires surgery. Well, there's a lot of steps to take medically before you ever get to the point of surgery, and then you need to recover from the surgery. And then to know, for instance, are you going to need lifetime physical therapy, lifetime medication, lifetime injections, those sorts of things. And so once you've reached kind of what we call maximum medical improvement, that's when we know, OK, this mm. is probably as good as it gets from a medical standpoint. Now we know what your economic damages are. Now we know what we can calculate for your non-economic damages, meaning pain and suffering. And then that's, you know, at that point, we start the negotiation process. Yeah. So, you know, I never thought about that before, but it just sort of uh, reinforces the point of don't quickly settle. Because, Absolutely. Right. Because all of your sort of pain and suffering and damages may not be totally understood. Absolutely. And that is the thing that we always ca caution people against, you know, because these insurance companies, sometimes they will call you the day after a car accident and offer you $5,000, $10,000, which may sound like a lot of money. Until mm -hmm. you realize that you may need, you know, annual, you know, injections or medical treatment for many years, which could, you know, easily, um, you know, be way more than that than that money. Right, right. And if if if, uh, if one of these cases, well, let's first let me first ask the question: approximately what percentage of of the total cases that you take actually end up going to trial? I would say, you know, it's a it's a small amount of all the cases that we handle. You know, we also handle medical malpractice cases, and those are, are more litigation heavy nursing home cases. Those tend to go to trial, I'd say, a little bit more often than the auto accident cases. But it definitely is, you know, the majority of our cases we are able to settle uh, before there's a trial. Some cases, a, a lot of cases, we're able to settle before we even file a lawsuit. Got it. Got it. And do any of these cases uh, go to arbitration? You know, uh, the cases that go to arbitration, those are medical malpractice and nursing home um, abuse and neglect cases because under Florida law, the law is a little bit funny on that. But, um, you know, if you have signed an agreement to arbitrate, for instance, uh, if you're entering into a long term care facility, uh, you know, you can be required to arbitrate. Mm -hmm. And also there are yes. certain statutes where in the pre suit uh, period in a medical malpractice case. Uh, the the physicians or hospital can request um, to arbitrate, and you can enter into kind of an agreement on that as well. Nice, nice. Uh, so, can you tell us uh, again? Take us through sort of the different types of cases, and if maybe there's a case that you'd like to highlight and talk about a little bit uh, that you know was was meant something special to to you you folks. Sure. Yeah. You know, um, we, like I said, we handle cases that involved, uh, you know, catastrophic injuries and wrongful death. That's all that, that we do. I would say that the, the cases that stand out to me as, you know, not necessarily the most meaningful, it's always, you know, the work we do is very important and every client is dear to us. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but I will say that, um, you know, we've had a few cases like this, but one that stands out to me, um, a client that I'd represented in another type of matter contacted me and his brother had been involved in an accident and his brother had been cited. His brother was catastrophically injured. I mean, it was a really terrible crash, but his brother had been cited by the police as being the at fault driver in the accident. 
And so he was calling me just to say, hey, you know, can you help us out with this traffic citation? <clears throat> My brother <clears throat> was in the hospital. Um, and it turned out when we investigated that his brother was not at fault at all. It was the 18 wheeler that had been involved in the accident that was at fault for making an illegal U-turn in the middle of an intersection mm. from the far right lane. And But there were no witnesses um, necessarily to the accident when it happened. And so the police were doing the very best they could with the evidence presented to try to determine who caused the accident. But when we got in there and investigated and found out that his brother was the victim and yes. you know, it was the, the truck that was at fault, you know, that was a game changer, um, you know, not only, you know, from the, the legal standpoint for the damages we were able to recover, but just really, I think, for the, the peace of mind of the family and, uh, you know, of the client that it was not his fault at all. You know, he yeah. was doing exactly what he should have been doing. And so things like that where you can get in and because of our investigation, we can figure out the facts were completely different than what they maybe seemed at first. I think those are always ones that are, um, you know, special. Yeah, yeah. I never thought of this, that part of your, what you guys do is investigate the, the situation. And is that uh, something that the the lawyers in the firm do, or, or is there a special set of skills and you hire investigators to do those types of things? <clears throat> Absolutely. So, you know, it, it kind of depends, um, you know, with roadway design cases, for instance, with cases that are uh, involving work zones, um, you know, I have uh, quite a bit of experience in that. So I can look at a set of construction drawings for roadway, you know, construction work. And I can kind of, you know, tell by looking at photographs, whether or not they were following like the maintenance of traffic plan and things like that. So there is a certain amount that mm. I can do on my own. Uh, but we also hire reconstructionists. And those are the guys that go out there and they look at things like skid marks on the roadway. They look at the damage on the vehicle and they're able to do, you know, engineering um, calculations to really figure out, you know, uh, where the cars were actually located, how fast they were going, and what really happened to cause this accident. Yeah, yeah. You know, it it seems to me that uh, this this segment of the law is very competitive. You know, I see advertising on TV almost every day, uh, various different firms saying, hey, call us. So how do you sort of stand apart? What separates your firm from some of the other competition? Sure. Um, and, that, and that's a really good question. And you're right. It's a very competitive market here, especially in Florida. Um, I will say that I think what that what separates our firm is the level of personal service that we give to each and every person that calls our office. You know, even if we're not able to take a case, we have a list of resources and we try to make sure that every person that calls our office uh, gets put in touch with a resource that they need that will be helpful to them. Um, and, you know, we've we've been doing this, you know, I've been doing it for about 20 years and and my husband, who's my law partner, he's been doing it for about the, the same amount of time. And it's our, you know, the happy clients that we have in those relationships and, and you know, the word of mouth and just the, you know, our kind of our reputation, in the community, I think, for being good lawyers, um, you know, really getting the job done and being efficient. Uh, it's our, always our goal to maximize the financial recovery in the least amount of time possible. Yeah. Do you also get uh, referrals from other attorneys where, you know, I call I call the attorney that helped me with my house closing and he says, no, nah, I don't do this kind of stuff. Uh, how do you de kind of develop those networks and that that sort of reputation? Yeah, we do. We get a lot of referrals from other lawyers. Um, my husband and I, we worked at uh, the largest law firm in Jacksonville for many years. I actually became a partner at that law firm. And at the time that I joined that for many years ago, there were 100 lawyers there. So we have wow. a very deep connection in the legal community, um, thanks in large part to those connections that we made many years ago. So, yeah, we get uh, referrals from other lawyers very often, which is great. Oh, wow, that's great. And how do you do you guys do advertising and as well or is it pretty much word of mouth and referrals? We do advertising. Um, we do, you know, a lot of what we do right now is more, I would call it maybe grassroots. You know, we're on social media. We sponsor I-9 Sports, which is really big here in Jacksonville. We are currently looking into, um, you know, possibly doing billboards in the future, possibly doing um, TV. We have some streaming commercials uh, that a lot of people tell me they saw me on TV and that sort of thing. So we're kind of looking into that, I'd say, as we grow. We've been growing um, pretty quickly in the last few years. So that's definitely something that we're thinking about. Yeah. So can you tell me how big the law firm is, number of attorneys and stuff? 
Sure. Yeah, we have five attorneys. And like I said, we have three locations. We have a location in Nocatee, which is in Ponte Vedra, Florida. We have one on the south side of town in Jacksonville. And in, uh, our newest location is downtown Jacksonville. Okay, great. And uh, so how do you, when, when, you, th when you think about uh, the, the law that you practice, right? And the, and the, the benefit that you bring to your clients. I mean, that must be very rewarding. But take us back a little bit. What sort of uh, made you go into law in, you know, 20 plus years ago when you decided to go to law school? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that I grew up when I was a, a little girl, I wanted to be a police officer. I always kind of had this sense of justice and fairness yeah. in my mind. And then as I got older, I think that kind of just evolved into I wanted to become a lawyer. Uh, and so I went to law school and I actually was very interested in doing criminal defense work. And but I knew that in order to, you know, kind of take that path, I needed to get some ex some real life experience. And so I interned for the state attorney's office actually in Clay County, which is next to us here in Jacksonville one summer. Um, and it was really eye opening. And I realized that I did not want to do criminal law. Uh, but at that point, I wasn't I wasn't 100 percent sure, you know, what exact area I wanted to do. And so I had a few lucky breaks. And like I said, I ended up at the largest law firm here in Jacksonville, and I was able to get experience in, in many different types of litigation. Uh, and I, I worked in commercial litigation for many years, and I ended up representing engineers in roadway design cases. So I was on the defense mm -hmm. of cases that now I'm on the plaintiff side. And I loved it. I really loved working with those clients. I learned so much. Um, but, you know, at some point, I think my heart was really pulled to helping people and families as opposed to uh, corporations, as much as I love, you know, working with the people that I represented. Um, you know, I was working mostly for insurance companies. And um, so I kind of just felt my heart pulled to to kind of switching sides and, and representing families and individuals. Yeah. Now, you know, you, you said you worked for a big law firm. You made it to partner. So many people would say, hey, you've made it, right? The, you're, you've, you've reached kind of where everyone, most law, law people want to be. And then you decided uh, to join your husband and start a, a, your own law firm. Talk a little bit about sort of that decision-making process and sort of what the early days were like and blazing out on your own. Yeah, absolutely. So my husband actually started Bagot Law in 2012. We, uh, I made partner the same year that I had twins. And um, my husband soon after that decided that it was time for, he was working at another firm at that point, and he decided this is the time to start Bagot Law. It had always been a dream of his to open his own law firm. And so really, as soon as he did that, very soon after that, I kind of just, you know, realized that um, I wanted to kind of join in on the family business. And I saw the success that he was having. And like I said, I really, my heart was kind of pulled towards helping individuals and families. Yeah. And so then three years later in 2015, I left my firm and I joined him and I've never looked back. It's been been very exciting. It's been exciting to be, we, we call it, we actually have four children now and we call Bagot Law our fifth child. You know, it's been fun building the firm with him and working with him. And we met many years ago working together as lawyers. And so we've just kind of carried that on. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story. Uh, what was, when you guys started the firm, what was something, uh, I have a two-part question, what was something that was much harder than you thought it would be, and then something that you really dreaded and thought it would be really difficult turned out to be really easy? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And I will say that I think um, I think the hard parts were getting things set up from a technology standpoint and getting, um, you know, payroll and different things like that set up. You know, we had always worked as lawyers for other law firms and right. those behind the scenes uh, business details, you know, were something that we had to learn on our own. Um, and so that took a little bit of time to do. Uh, and I will say that something that I think we both, uh, you know, wondered about and worried about was where would our cases come from, you know, once we stepped out, um, you know, on our own. And we just, like I said, we've been very fortunate that that you know, hasn't been hard. We've continued to grow year after year um, and make even more connections in the community and be able to help uh, wonderful people. So the marketing has been easier, I think, I think due to our, our deep roots in this community. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So if uh, we, what words of advice would you have for 
either a law student or somebody who's just about to graduate from law school. Uh, do you have any words of wisdom for them? Absolutely. I think my biggest advice is to get experience in what you think you want to do, because I think so often things are not not what maybe you think they will be. Mm. Um, you know, I know that when I was in law school, um, I just, I wanted to be in the courtroom every single day. You know, I thought that that would just, you know, be the most exciting thing, not realizing, you know, when I got into the real world that, uh, you know, unless you're doing criminal law, you know, uh, things like that, you're not in court every day. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, office work, which I, you know, ended up loving and, you know, writing briefs and motions and, you know, doing legal research and all those types of things. But um, you know, just to, to dip your toe in the water, maybe through an internship or something like that to find out if it is, in fact, something that you're passionate about. Yeah. And and is your advice uh, for a, a new graduate to, to join a larger firm and and kind of uh, learn at their expense, so to speak? You know, uh, I'm not sure. I had a law professor that I, I'll never forget. She said that most lawyers stay for life at the third law firm they work at. And I remember she said that, and I thought I thought that was strange because in my in my mind, I think growing up, you know, my parents had a strong work ethic, were very loyal to their companies. I thought, gosh, that seems kind of you know like jumping around. I can't imagine that I will you know jump around to three different law firms, um, you know. But now looking back, I would say you know myself and you know so many other people. That is, you kind of move around, and and she always said so you'll end up where you're supposed to be. So don't mm. stress about it. If you started a small law firm and it's not for you, then move to a big law firm. And if you started a big law firm and that's not for you, so I really think that you know, again, it's just one of those things that you know you won't know until you get there. Um, and so long as you're doing good work uh, and um, you know have good people have good opinions of you, you know, that you're working for, I think that you can transition pretty easily and, and try a different size of law firm or, you know, even different things, um, you know, government positions in health council. Sure. There's so many, so many options. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. That's great advice. So uh, where can our listeners uh, learn more about you and uh, Baggett Law? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a website, it's baggettlaw.com. Um, and we also have many social media channels, LinkedIn. Um, we have a YouTube page. I actually also have a TikTok page. I don't I don't post as much as I probably should. I don't have as much time as I wish I did. Um, but yeah, so you can find us in the digital world. Great. Well, we will make sure all of that contact information is in the show notes. Uh, now, is there something that I have not asked you uh, that you'd like to share with our audience? You know, I think the only thing that I that I would like people to know really is just um, what to do right after a car accident. This is something that mm. we always have these conversations after the fact, and it's the chances of people getting into a car accident are, are very high. Um, and so I think people just should know if you get into a car accident, if you can safely take photos um, and even videos of the scene, so long as you're able to do so safely and absolutely always get that police report. I know sometimes people want to exchange insurance information that is a terrible idea because even um, if people are intending, you know, the best and, and, you know, believe that they remember the way things happened, oftentimes our memories change, you know, within hours or overnight. And if you don't have the evidence, um, you know, the photos, the police report, that kind of thing, you know, then you, then you really never know what the other person is going to say as far as what happened um, in the accident or maybe whose fault it was. So definitely always get those photos. Um, get the police report, just be patient and wait for it because it really could be meaningful um, in your case. And again, if you think that maybe the accident happened differently than the police recorded it, you know, that's something that isn't set in stone. So. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent advice. Well, Amanda, thank you very much uh, for being on the podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation. Great. I did too. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to 15 Minutes. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time.